Um, so Fiona, I think, are you here now? I am now here. Great. Took me a minute, but I'm here. <laughs> um, if do you know, like, are there everyone that you invited and are expecting? Can you see their names up on this list, or should I wait a few more minutes? Um, I can't see the list. Um, so every computer looks different, but there should be a way to open a participants list. Oh, I see. Yep, we've got Rich and Ryan. Hey, folks. Yep. Joanna. Yeah, everyone that I'm expected is here. And uh, Tim, what about yourself? Um, I think we're missing three. Oh no, Gwen just joined, so that brings us down to two. Okay, we can wait a couple minutes. Yeah, just give it till five after another minute or so. Okay, I think we'll go. We're ready to start on our end. Um. So, for the sake of today, we can um, try and make it as like informal as it could be in person, which sometimes is weird for online meetings. But if there are questions, feel free to interject, and I'll stop and get to those rather than waiting to get to the end. That's kind of usually the way I prefer to do things. Um, I imagine pretty much none of you know who I am, so I can start with that. My name is Katie McLean, and I work with Clean Annapolis River Project, uh, or CARP. So we're based in Annapolis Royal, and we work within the watershed area. So it's roughly kind of between Berwick and Aylesford is our headwaters of the Annapolis River and extends down to, um, we include up to Digby in our watershed area. And since about 2012, our organization has been working on a project that focuses on wood turtle monitoring and stewardship, because we do have kind of several pockets of wood turtle populations within our watershed area. Uh, so over the last few months, I've had the chance to speak with Tim and Fiona uh, and a few others at um, both Nova Scotia Nature Trust and St. Mary's River Association about opportunities to kind of expand volunteer engagement and activities related to wood turtles. Uh, so the idea was I can share what we do from uh, our volunteer programming side of things and then maybe that's something that could be expanded uh, by your staff or volunteers. So today I'm going to focus on the field survey methods we use for wood turtles and I'll keep it fairly short but uh, the hope is maybe when things change because of COVID uh, we can also do some in-field and in-person training as well. Um, so Oh, give me a second to figure out my slides here. Uh, so some of, the, I used a canned presentation from past volunteer training that I do with volunteers. So some of it's going to be very watershed specific and doesn't matter to you. Uh, so things like our watershed boundaries are less important from your perspective. Um, and I don't know where people calling in today sit in terms of their familiarity with wood turtles. So. I have some background stuff. If everyone's like, we know this, move on, feel free to speak up. Uh, but just kind of to start at the beginning with why we're interested in wood turtles, it is in part because they are a listed species at risk. So in uh, Canada, they're listed on Sarah Schedule 1 as a threatened species. 
Uh, and there, they have a parallel listing through the Nova Scotia Endangered Species Act as threatened. Uh, but if you take a look at the IUCN ranks, which, I mean, we don't use often, but to put it in kind of a, a bigger picture, they list the wood turtle as endangered. Um, I do always like to include pictures of our four freshwater turtle species when I'm introducing any of our volunteer stewardship work related to wood turtles, uh, because it is inevitable, inevitable that you will have misidentification of species, even yeah, it just always happens. So it's worth pointing out all four and then maybe uh, depending on the context of where your volunteers are from or where you're doing your surveys, point out the ones that they're very unlikely to be or may uh, be confused with. So for example, Blanding's turtles are pretty easy to rule out probably for anyone in this room just because they have such a limited distribution. Uh, even within the Annapolis River watershed, we don't have any known populations of Blanding's turtles. So usually immediately if someone says they've seen them, uh, I know that they probably aren't 100% confident with their identification. Um, probably the most confused species we get is between snapping turtles and wood turtles uh, because that kind of textured shell uh, Snapping turtles, once they're bigger, people are pretty good at knowing it's not a wood turtle. And then on the other hand, like painted turtles to me look really different. They're smaller, they're shinier, they hang out in groups, uh, but that orange color sometimes throws people. So uh, it's also important to make the distinction between like the large patches of orange on the throat and underside of the limbs on wood turtles versus like the stripes that painted turtles have. And then in terms of identifying features for our wood turtles, uh, the what I've been told, I don't know if it's true, is that they get their name from the woody texture of their shell, so their carapace, the top shell. Um, I've also been told they get their name because they'll spend time in the woods foraging. So go with whichever one you want to believe. Uh, but they do have a very rough texture to their shell. Uh, on the right hand side in the adult photo, you can see some of that yellow patterning coming out on the scoots, but a lot of the time when we find them in terrestrial habitat, they're so muddy and dusty that you don't see those colors coming through. It's really only like if it's been raining or they're in aquatic habitat that you can see those little speckly yellow colors coming out. And then on the bottom shell, so the plastron, they are yellow with these black blotches. Uh, so if anyone has ever seen the plastron for a Blanding's turtle, if you couldn't see any of the limbs with that orange color, they're really easy to mistake with one another. They have very similar looking plastrons, uh, but everything else about them looks very different. So um, different shape shell, Blanding's turtle is much more dome shaped with like the yellow little speckles in it, the bright yellow on the chin. So. And it's also really unusual that the only thing someone would see is the plastron, so usually not an issue. And then with juveniles, um, like our other freshwater turtle species, they're about the size of a toonie when they hatch. And for wood turtles, they're kind of just like a dusty gray color. They're, they're actually like rather nondescript, except they're very cute and small and have incredibly long tails proportionate to the rest of their bodies. Um, if you were to look at a snapping turtle hatchling, at first they look kind of similar, but on the snapping turtles, you can even right when they're born, see that kind of like pointed um, shape on some of their scoops. So you can pretty readily tell them apart once you're familiar with what they look like. And painted turtles just straight up look different. So they're really easy to tell apart. Um, so this is a bad range map of wood turtles. It kind of just assumes that all the spaces in between populations are filled in. It's much more patchy than what this would tell you. Uh, and some kind of background about life history of wood turtles. 
Uh, they can live for 50 plus years. Uh, it's more like 30 years on average in the wild. Uh, they're slow maturing, just like our other four species, and that's one of the factors that contributes to their vulnerability of becoming a species at risk. Uh, so with the wood turtle, it's somewhere around 15 years on average that it takes for them to be able to lay their first viable nest. And then unfortunately, most nests are not going to be successful, either because there was something um, like the embryos themselves fail or more likely uh, there was predation. We see huge amounts of uh, raccoon predation in our area. And I imagine it would probably be similar where you guys are as well. Um, females will lay a single clutch per year. Uh, documented, it says between four and 19 eggs. I think the average that I've seen in nests is around 10. So I've never seen as many as 19. Um, I see more with like snapping turtles than, than wood turtles. And they are an opportunistic omnivore. So a lot of the time we see them with slugs hanging out of their mouth. They'll eat little wild strawberries. They'll eat um, food from whatever type of farm they're on. Uh, alder leaves, grass, other berries, flowers, kind of you name it. Uh, they're not active predators, so they're not chasing fish or things down. I don't think they do a lot of feeding in their aquatic habitat. Um, and one of the, the key things to keep in mind with wood turtles is their habitat requirements differ from our other three species. So a stream or river is their primary aquatic habitat, and then they'll need a sandy nesting place uh, and they'll also potentially use forested areas for foraging, but they will also use human landscapes. So they'll use farms um, or backyards or whatever it is now. But the big thing is streams or rivers, because uh, when I'm getting public reports from someone, maybe for the first time, and they're describing their pond, and there's four of them basking together, you can almost immediately rule out that it was a wood turtle just behaves based on that behavior and that habitat use. Uh, maybe I'll check in now, Is does anyone have questions? And I'm gonna make sure, I, I can't see where I can open my chat window, but people can unmute and ask if they do have one. Um, so up here we have a list of the threats based on the uh, recovery strategy for wood turtles in Canada. So the Environment and Climate Change Can Canada document, that's online, so I'm gonna blow through that. Oops. Uh, and up here, I just have... I was just gonna say, I think we'll have to add mining and industrial action to that list. Oh yeah, we don't yet, but you guys <laughs> might have to, that's a little depressing. Um, so up here I have examples of habitat from our watershed. Uh, I imagine some of you are familiar what, with a known wood turtle habitat in the St. Mary's River watershed, so I don't know how similar or not it looks because I haven't had a chance to, to come up to your area for surveys before. Uh, but on the top left we have a ve vegetated riparian buffer. Um, on the top right and bottom left, that is the same site. So it's behind uh, a property that was actually used for years and years as a dump. Um, and the turtles still seem quite content to make use of the open sandy spaces for nesting on the actual dump property. And then there's this really nice riparian area on a tributary of the Annapolis River. Um, and the bottom, I think, is probably in the Lawrencetown area, just an example of a small uh, riparian area within a residential neighborhood where there's still wood turtles. Um, but kind of relatively substantial rivers is the theme I'm going for there. Uh, and then here we have some examples of wood turtles found in the field. These are all nice and easy to see. 
Uh, the reality is that a lot of the time they're going to be tucked under those leaves uh, or not so obvious, but doesn't always make great photos when I take pictures of them when they're still hidden. So that's probably after we've pulled them out and post them. This was um, a juvenile that was found exactly in this position. And it's one of the only examples of a juvenile that we found during a survey. So I think that turtle was about four years old. I could, we could probably age it if we, uh, it's not the best resolution, but you can see about one, two, three, three-ish rings. Then we'll talk about aging in a moment anyway. Um, but I don't know whether it's differences in habitat use or just their size and ability to camouflage, but it is very uncommon for us to find individuals that are kind of under 10 years of age. We notch hatchlings and then I never see them again. Although chances are most of them have been eaten, unfortunately. So at this point in our program, we really focus on three types of surveys. So visual surveys, which is a really glorified way of saying you're walking around in potential or known habitat looking for wood turtles. Uh, and we do notch turtles so we can collect mark recapture data. Uh, we have a couple of sites that are set up for fixed one kilometer transects. That was um, that was an initiative that was undertaken because one of our partner organizations was trying to come up with a more formal method for long-term monitoring. So the idea was to establish some of these one kilometer transects at fixed sites so they could be repeated each year. Uh, and we could control for as many variables as possible. So things like numbers of surveyors, uh, the, the way you distribute kind of your effort between those two surveyors so that the data was more comparable than just using visual surveys. Because even though we do record things like effort, um, there's a lot of variation. So our visual surveys could be two staff members who really know what they're looking for who are going out or it could be 25, you know, cubs or guides who know what a turtle looks like, but may have never before uh, looked for one and have a whole range of attention spans. So the fixed transects are just for comparability. And then nesting surveys are focused at identifying nests for protection and then subsequent monitoring. So we can put cages on similar to what's done at Kejimkujik National Park for Blanding's turtles. Um, so in recent years, I mean, <laughs> permitting and the law has always been important, um, but especially in recent years, there's really been efforts by uh, Department of Lands and Forestry to make sure that everyone is doing their part in communicating uh, private landowner responsibilities through the Nova Scotia Endangered Species Act, and also ensuring that volunteer programs are conforming to best practices, as well as any existing regulations. Uh, so I've made sure in any public training that we do uh, that I just present what some of the key points under the Nova Scotia Endangered Species Act are. And so the big one is uh, no person shall ki kill, injure, possess, disturb, da da da, -da. Um, Don't touch wood turtles, basically, unless you have a permit and you're able to take measurements. Uh, and then the second important, important point is that a no person shall destroy, disturb, or interfere with, or attempt to do those things uh, with a dwelling or place that is occupied or hab habitually occupied. Uh, so for wood turtles, um, places that are habit habitually occupied would include an overwintering site and would include a known nesting site. So you... Uh, by the law, are not supposed to disturb those areas. Um, and then, I mean, there's always the balance. We don't want to try to alienate volunteers and landowners by being overly regulatory and heavy-handed in our messaging. Uh, but 
there is it's not uncommon for people to want to help turtles by maybe relocating them to their pond or their safer property and just ending up putting them at greater risk. Uh, we have had a radio tracked wood turtle that someone relocated to their home and we were able over time to watch it make its way back to its regular uh, habitat. So it had many more roads and places that it had to get through because of that action. Um, and then um, maybe for, before I get to identifying individual turtles, we in the past did conduct radio telemetry. We no longer have a working receiver. Um, and just in terms of where the, we see the most value in terms of requesting funds, it's not in equipment to do radio tracking. We really try and focus on working with landowners and community members who are potentially interacting with wood turtles. Uh, so we are no longer doing radio tracking, but we do have some transmitters available. So if anyone's organization ever goes in that direction, I don't see why we couldn't lend those. Most of them were loaners to us from MTRI after they retired them from their Blanding's turtle program. Um, so, uh, marking turtles or notching turtles is does anyone on here know do you have I well I know there's notch turtles in the St. Mary's River because I've seen them in the database is that something that either of your organizations has done to date as far uh, as I know <laughs> oh sorry you go ahead Megan Myers here from the River Association so we um did turtle surveys through the Habitat Stewardship Program back in, I think, 2006 to 2009, and did notching of the turtles way back then. Okay. Cool. Um, and Fiona from Nature Trust, we haven't, as far as I know, our organization hasn't done any um, active notching. Okay. So the the notching scheme and the codes are for the full province. So uh, I think for this year, I am assigned someone like numbers 2,200 to 2,250, something like that. Um, and the idea is each group who's working on wood turtles would be assigned a different block so that hopefully we wouldn't accidentally use the same numbers. Uh, I know, also know there is duplicate numbers in the database, but a lot of the time it's uh, not really an issue because they're in such distant watersheds that they're definitely not being confused for one another. Uh, but with turtles, hopefully you can see the diagram up here. Uh, they're, the scheme for an 11 and 12 scoot turtle really is the same because you can see, like, if you count the scoots beginning um, at their head, so at the, the top of the shell, if you were imagining a turtle. Um, with its head kind of facing up to you, just how it is in the, the photo, uh, Scoot 12 isn't assigned any value in terms of the notching scheme. So even if you accidentally count wrong, if you were counting from Scoot 1, it shouldn't affect your codes. So the Scoots on the left-hand side, uh, when we kind of annotate the codes, are read first, and then the right-hand sides, so you can see on the left, Scoot 1, if it has a notch, gets the value 2,000. Scoot 2 gets the value 700. Scoot 3 gets the value 200, and kind of so on following that pattern. So for example, uh, Scoot 10 on the right-hand side is assigned the value 4. So if you were to find a previously notched turtle, um, if the last time there was notching efforts uh, was kind of 2006 to 9, it may be fairly difficult to discern those notches. Uh, turtles have a good habit of banging themselves up over time or having accidents with equipment. So there's kind of just these natural chip or not the result of notching, but there's chips in their shells. Uh, and they also just start to kind of wear down and aren't so visible V-shaped triangles. Uh, so we will clean up notches when we 
find turtles that have been previously notched and they're just starting to kind of wear down. Uh, or when there is turtles that are unnotched, we'd consider it a first capture and provided that someone who is trained and permitted to do notching is available uh, either on site because they were doing the survey or able to kind of meet up with the field team, then we'll try and get notches in as many individuals as possible. Uh, you can see for this turtle up here, um, it has notches in scoots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is that right? Yeah, nine, which gives it the value 20. And on the right hand side, one, scoop two, eight and 10. Uh, so what you would do is take the values assigned to each of those notches and sum them. So 400 plus 20 plus 40 plus four gives you 464. And when we're in the field, we try and as frequently as possible print updated field sheets that tell you uh, the basic information about each individual that has been previously notched. So I actually, Oh, here, I put it on here. So turtle number 464 is Eden. We'll have her notch code there. There is sometimes cases where the numbers don't work out and it's just because it's a mistake that was made previously and no one ever caught it. Uh, that's why taking photos and filling out the rest of the data is important. Um, Eden is actually a male. Uh, it's an adult turtle. And we cannot sex turtles until they are adults. I think I have some slides to talk about sexing a little later on. Uh, we also assign a, a population and then a site for each survey area. So Eden, as well as his friends, Sam and Ping, actually Ping passed away, but they're all at uh, the same site on South River, and then we name them based on access, so Victoria Road um, or Whitman Road. And then I also include when the individual was last found and measurements were taken, and that is to avoid over-measuring turtles. So if possible, we prefer not to handle them. So if I know a turtle was already found this season and it was measured last week, there's going to be no perceptible change. So you don't need to take out the calipers and put it through that process, even though we try and measure as quickly and with as little stress to the individual as possible. Of course, it's more stressful than not being handled at all. So if there's no good reason to measure it, then we don't measure it. Question? Yes. Um, just back to the scoot notching, what is it that changes from year to year so that you're able to add up totals properly? Is it just which scoots you're notching or is it the total numbers and then how do you know what set of well, numbers to use for what year? Yeah, so it's um, always been Jeffy McNeil who works at Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute and uh, was a co-chair on the wood turtle recovery team and is now a co-chair of the reptile recovery team who assigns us like, blocks of numbers. Uh, so say she tells me I need to do 2,200. I need to come up with the number combination that with the least number of notches gives me that result. So uh, it always, I always like quadruple count it in the field, but say I needed 2,200. Uh, that's a relatively easy one because I could do notch left one, left three. And then if next turtle 2,201, would be notch left one plus left three, and then I need the one, so plus right 11. Um, so even within our organization, say I get 50 digits, I'm allowed to work with that year. And like, that's an ambitious year. We've never found 50 new adult wood turtles to notch. If I had two teams going out on the same day and they both, might both potentially be notching, I'll tell them, like, you get number 2,205 through 2,210, and then I'll give the different group a different group, and they work within their own numbers. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I think so. It'd probably make more sense if we had a few um, turtles or turtle photos in front of us to practice on. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I have I have little laminated turtle carapace pictures where I've cut out notches for people to practice on. <laughs> and I found like if you're doing youth programs, it's actually kind of a fun game to get people to code the turtles. They like it. So if you ever need something, it's really easy <laughs> to make. Good to know. Um, and I mean, sometimes people mess up and they get the wrong number and you can't fix them in the future. Uh, it's If you can find the turtle again, that's the hard part. So in terms of sexing turtles, uh, like I said before, you can't do it until they are sexually mature. So about 15 years of age. Uh, and you can tell the sex based on the shape of the plastron, so the bottom shell. It's a little hard to tell with photos. Um, it, it really helps to either have a turtle in your hands or I've got a couple of shells um, that I'm able to use as examples. But if it is a female, so on the right hand side are our females, it's going to stay flat. Uh, when they're young, they're all relatively flat. The females stay flat and shaped. The males, on the other hand, develop a concave shape. And if you think about how turtles mate, just put them together like puzzle pieces, right? So the male is on top of the female's shell. He's got to have that curve in his plastron in the bottom shell in order to fit up there. Um, so not hard to remember. Um, but really hard to see based on these pictures. Um, you can, yeah, you can kind of see on this bottom one here, it looks like it's a little recessed, but you just have to trust me, I guess. Um, I, I'm just flipping through to see, I don't know if I put anything up about aging, so I'll go back to a previous photo, because uh, again, this is something I'd usually do if I have a shell in hand, it's much easier. Um, you can, up to a certain point, age wood turtles based on the number of rings in their scoops. So kind of like tree rings, they put on a ring of growth each year until they kind of reach their peak maturity and then they start to wear out. It's like our bones, you know, like after 25 years or whatever, they just, they're wearing out. They're not continuing to develop in the same way. Uh, so really for turtles that are 20 years plus, we don't get a reliable age. Uh, that's where if there's previous uh, mark recapture data from maybe like 2003 and we knew the turtle was 12 at that point and it was really clear, you can just add the number of years that have elapsed since that point in time. Um, so hopefully you can kind of make out the fact there are rings on these scoops. Uh, the center ones in this turtle have been changed. So can you guys see my cursor as I'm moving it around? I see some heads nodding. So there's no rings left on here. It looks like it's been worn or chipped away somehow. Uh, you can see that you don't have very clear rings developed here. Uh, but on these scoots to the side, we can kind of see at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Maybe 16. Um, I don't have an age for her on this. So it's approximate. You know, and what I usually do is count a couple of scoots on both the carapace and plastron and also ask someone else to count as well. And we'll often take the average, unless they give me something that's way off. If they say like a thousand, then okay, we're not going to go with that. But it's not a kind of perfect process as turtles get older. Uh, oh, the question I saw was cut off, but uh, two points. I think someone just dialed in, and if you can click mute, we're just hearing a bit of stuff going on in the background of your computer. Uh, and in terms of aging based on plastron scoots, yes, you can do that. 
I just find with wood turtles, they wear out the bottom of their shell relatively quickly. So sometimes you don't have as good definition in the kind of rings. Yeah, I don't, well, it makes sense. They're kind of walking around dragging themselves. So you see a lot of wear and tear. With juveniles though, it's beautiful, like really nice clear rings. Um, and actually on the bottoms here, you can see uh, often with males, it's those inner parts of their scoot where you can see the rings because they have that concave shape and they're not dragging on the ground. Um, she's looking pretty good as is she, but you can see like a lot of wear towards the outside and some are just smooth. Um, so we use Nova Scotia turtle daily effort cards. So if anyone has ever done work with Blanding's turtles, they look exactly the same. A lot of our materials were adapted from the Blanding's turtle work that MTRI and Parks Canada and others have done for years. So probably the hardest part of running a volunteer program is getting people to fill out data cards. So we do the best that we can. Um, having data without a data card, I still think is more valuable than nothing, but I don't think I will ever expect people to fill these out and get them to me 100%, even 50% of the time. Um, so it is what it is. Uh, they probably look scarier than they are. The, the biggest kind of burden with effort cards is that even when you don't see a turtle you should fill one out uh, because knowing where you haven't found turtles or maybe where there is a lot of effort but little to show for it is important to know over time uh, so even within our organization it gives me a sense of what sites maybe don't warrant so much focus for future field surveys so that I can encourage volunteers or staff to look at places we have less information about. Uh, so population and area are codes that get assigned based on your specific geographic location. Uh, and that's something I can check in with Jeffy or others because I imagine there are already codes that have been developed for the St. Mary's River watershed. And it's really nice to try and be consistent with what already exists. Uh, we haven't done that the best as project leaders have changed. And we, you can go back and clean it up, but it's a bit of a nightmare. Uh, for, so not something volunteers need to worry about so much. Um, and really, like, I try and tell people what to put for population. Well, population for us is always Annapolis River Watershed, ARW. That's easy. I try and get them to get the area right. I don't really care because I can easily pull up their GPS locations and fix those labels after the fact. Um, so what's probably more important is that they know what to put as the project name and that they get the cards to you uh, and that they to some level record their start and end times. Uh, weather data is nice to have, but again, not something that I think is 100% essential. And then, of course, most important is what did they actually observe when they were out doing their survey? So the province is interested in collecting information on other species. So it is definitely worth encouraging people to uh, record observations of snapping turtles or painted turtles or if you're in the right place, Blanding's turtles as well as your target, which might be wood turtles. And then just um, in the case that data, pieces of data get separated, I do try and always uh, get people to write in the comments information about a turtle if they saw one. So can you put the notch code or can you write first capture, like first new, new turtle was a male at this place? Uh, because then if for some reason they forget to submit the turtle information card, I have at least a little bit of information to go with and fill in the blanks. Um, and then up here, it says volunteer effort. So I always have to go through and sort out our staff person volunteer effort. But it is really nice if people fill this out because say you get funding through a program like HSP 
it gives you an easy way to enumerate the contribution of volunteer hours to your program, which is one of the things you'll have to report on. So that makes sense for effort cards. You just write down when you go out. Do monitors walk this same transect each time? Um, so for us, for fixed transects, they are the same. For volunteer, uh, for kind of our general volunteer stuff, it's a little more open. So uh, we do have people who kind of take responsibility for certain sites, but they may choose to look at different portions of those sites, um, depend like on different days. They're not like really strict transect lines for those. It's more open-ended. So if water levels change, they might take advantage of getting to places they couldn't get earlier in the spring because it was flooded out, things like that. Um, I do encourage people to just use an app on their phone and then they can send me the tracks of where they walked. So there's lots of different options. I think the one that I use is called My Tracks. And it's a nice bonus. Um, it's, it's more stuff you have to manage in the end, but it does let you really clearly see what territory has been covered or not, especially when you have a bit more of those open-ended style of surveys. Um, the back of the card you can probably ignore because it's if you're doing uh, trap data collection. And then we have the Nova Scotia turtle observation card. Um, and I think one of the things we've been talking about, so Tim and Fiona and others, is maybe coming up with some type of abbreviated reporting card for people who um, are maybe seeing incidental surveys or aren't receiving kind of full wood turtle training. So a chance to get essential data, but maybe not as much as what this card asks you to do. Um, but say you were out on one of our surveys, we would use one of these Nova Scotia turtle observation cards. And they are used for each individual turtle that you see. So always an effort card. Unfortunately, a lot of the time there is no observation card because you don't get to see a wood turtle. Uh, if you do, then this is, most of it's pretty easy. I, I won't walk through absolutely everything because I can send all this information to you and it's relatively self-explanatory. We have also made a data dictionary where we explain all of these headings uh, because there is some stuff that is just maybe overly fancy in the way it's worded or just kind of too sciencey or technical for some of uh, like public volunteers who, yeah, I learned this a year ago, but how am I supposed to remember every detail? So we just give them a printout. Um, so things like first capture makes sense to me, but uh, isn't a term that people are maybe thinking about when they're doing surveys, but it really means it's unnot. It doesn't mean it's the first time it's recorded. It's just there's no reliable way in the field to know if it's been recorded. Uh, so I say that because I have an example of a wood turtle who lives at a, well, I don't know all of where it lives, but every spring it is reliably seen on the same guy's property almost to the day. Uh, it's never been notched because we've never been able to coordinate with each other for whatever reasons. Uh, but just based on photos, it has really unique chipping and also unique patterns on the those kind of black blotches on the plastron. So I know it's the same turtle each year. Uh, but if someone else found it in the field, it would be recorded as a first capture because there's no notches that you can go off of. Um, alive or dead, that's pretty easy. And for sighting methods, so we did update the card maybe two years ago. Uh, most cases for us, volunteers will be out on a visual survey with humans only, but uh, some people do bring their dogs with them. Um, I try, I don't necessarily encourage people to just because it does open up an opportunity for negative encounters between dogs and turtles. On the other hand, some people have dogs that have been trained to do reptile survey work. So Jeffy's Border Collie, for example, has tried to help us sniff out wood turtles before. Um, and there are volunteers who they bring out the dogs. 
like no matter what you tell them, that's what they're going to do. And I think that's okay as well. People just maybe need to follow practices like keeping them on a leash and keeping a distance from turtles. Um, but there is a spot for it, a formally trained survey dog versus basically every other dog. And then you can even put the dog's name if it's with you as well. Um, one of the reasons we were just interested in being able to see like is, is having dogs on these surveys actually leading to more detections, but before the cards had no space for this. So there was no way to go back and look at that information. Uh, the sighting type, if you're not using telemetry, it um, doesn't matter. So if tracking means tracking with some type of uh, tag, names that's easy we have our locations uh the big thing probably one of the number one pieces of information here is we want uh utm or a lat long or someone to go onto their phone and take a point uh whatever they can do so that after the fact they can fill this in or even better they can fill it in in the field um even as a practice for us and our like my coworkers. I always try and fill it in in the field because it's just so much easier to do it then rather than letting them pile up and be like, I'll do it when I'm at the office. Doesn't happen. Um, we have weather data. That's pretty straightforward. Um, behavior can be tough. So a lot of the time the turtle's seen you before you see it. So if it was... Uh, maybe terrestrial active, it stopped walking and it's now terrestrial stationary. So you just have to do your best and fill out what you see at the time. If you see food hanging out of its mouth, then, well, you can probably take a guess. It's foraging and eating, but it's also perhaps terrestrial stationary at the same time. So I don't love this checkbox section because people get maybe hung up on what the perfect answer is. You we just do your best and choose what it was doing. Um, its position is either in water, fully underwater, with its shell sticking out, or just with its head above the water and on land, uh, fully exposed, partially covered, could be maybe some grasses or sedges, and then fully covered. Uh, we do, when we were radio tracking, we had turtles that would like habitually bury themselves in piles of sticks. Um, it's l l much less frequent when we're just doing unaided visual surveys to find a fully covered turtle because we have no way to know it was there to look in that covered space in the first place. So... Uh, and then habitat capture is one that people sometimes get hung up on. It can be, okay, terrestrial, normally aquatic or flooded. So the difference would be kind of like your, your flood zones, your riparian areas that might be wet in the early spring um, or would be normally aquatic, but it's been a drought. And so there's some fluctuation there. Um, so it's like another one, like basically if it's on land, put on land. And if it's in water, put aquatic. And then if I think based on the site, when we go back, um, that it should have been something else, then I might adjust it. But I just don't get volunteers to worry about that because it's a bit, I don't know, just for whatever reason, it's one that people never feel confident filling out. Um, perch. What is it standing on? Again, to the best options that are available or include other. And then general habitat description. Um, we don't typically ask people to list the dominant vegetation. Again, it becomes onerous. That people will feel like they're not qualified to be doing volunteer surveys when really that's a level of detail that isn't necessary for our program. Uh, but it is nice if people can write details like it was an alder swamp. It was a grassy area. It was mixed forest. So kind of high level things. And then measurements. So um, the stuff's on the card here, but just for the sake of time, I'm going to jump down to the description of measurements. Um, 
So we don't have enough call of calipers to equip all our volunteers with equipment to do measurements. So in those cases, we just forgo the measurement data. It's enough to have the location, the sex, a really general habitat description. Um, we don't need to know the size for the purposes of our work. So if our real interest is working with that landowner to change haying practices, it doesn't matter if the turtle was 25 centimeters or 20 centimeters in length, it's an alive turtle and that's what counts. Uh, so I don't think the inability to collect detail measurements should ever be seen as kind of a reason not to do survey work. It's just a nice bonus when you have the opportunity. Um, so if we have the equipment with a volunteer team, then they will measure maximum carapace length, uh, the maximum width, the width at the bridge. So again, this is hard without a turtle or a shell in hand, but it's almost like you think of your hip and your waist measurements. So the bridge is the more narrow point, like your waist, and then your hips is the maximum carapace. Width. That's how I remember. Um, and then the plastron, so the bottom shell length and width, and the height, like if it was a turtle hamburger, how high is that turtle? Are you measurement data? Oh, Joanna, I can kind of hear about you, but it's a little choppy. Can you say that again? Is anyone using the measurement data that's being collected? I don't know if anyone's using it currently. Not that I know of. I, we submit it in the database, and so it's there in case someone wants to. Um, like Things like height data would have been important with coming up with recommendations for how high you should raise your mm -hmm. mower blade. But at this point, we know that. So I'm not sure. If who might be using it. So it's just one of those things. There's a repository of data for someone who might want to do a project on wood turtles. Okay. I, I was thinking um, I'm involved in banding birds at the end of each summer on Briar Island. And one of the things that we talk about is what we collect data for. Because it's stressful for the turtle, if we're not using the data for something, should we be collecting it? Yeah, it, that's one of the reasons I haven't worried about trying to get equipment to um, outfit all our volunteers so our staff have it and maybe one or two volunteers who have been like incredibly active because the indication has been from the reptile team that we should collect that data when possible but only one time per season um, but <laughs> yeah I did re-ask that question this year I'll write it down it is a scientist thing, though, too. We don't want as much data as possible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then weighing. So I, I don't know. I think weighing must be the most stressful process that they go through. Um, this video is showing a practice. I don't necessarily encourage. I usually like people to kneel when they're weighing them, just in case something happened and that bag slipped off the spring scale. If you can be as close to the ground as possible, I am sure that is better for the turtle um, versus standing upright and having, you know, a meter to fall. Well, no one's that tall, but just keep people cl close to the ground. Um, and this mesh bag is what we initially had when I started the job, but it's terrible because their little claws stick through the mesh. So I just replaced it with um, a different reusable grocery bag that isn't so easy for their claws to get hung up in because they do actively well it depends on the turtle some are sassier than others but they will in many cases try and get out of there and their claws get stuck in that mesh or in really loose fabrics um so mtri has developed a species at risk reporting app I don't have a data plan, so I don't actually use it. I can't attest to how well it works, but some of our volunteers do submit data through it, and it seems to work fine for them. Uh, it does not ask for the same level of detail. It, it looks for things like your location, time, your contact information, the species. So this is kind of a good option if you're not doing a lot of training, but just generally know that you have like recreational users or landowners in wood turtle habitat and want to, to encourage them to report sightings. Something like this might be an alternative to use. 
Um, and there's also just this sightings at species at risk.ca email address as well. One of the nice things about both of these is um, MTRI manages the data and they've been really good at getting us the information quickly so that if there is a landowner we want to follow up with, then we can do that relatively promptly. Um, I can see it's almost two o'clock, so I'm not going to talk about nesting stuff today. Uh, I'm hoping maybe by June we can do some in-person stuff. If I can make it up there, we can do another session. Um, but really, nesting surveys take place primarily through June, focused on sandy, gravelly habitats. It could be the side of roads. Uh, like other turtles, they have high nest site fidelity, so they will return to the same place each year. Uh, so it can be a pretty good predictor of what places to look for. Um, and there's just a little more that we try and communicate in terms of keeping a safe distance and not disturbing the turtle while she is nesting. They will often come out several days in a row and dig test pits uh, or start nesting and then hit a big rock and then they go back in. So we don't want people to jump the gun and try and get in there to protect the nest, but really this turtle's just still testing the nest substrate day after day. Um, but here you can see like this turtle, someone drove by and saw that, which I think is incredible because that's pretty well camouflaged <laughs> into the ground. Uh, and not a great nest site. Like that bridge was imminently under construction, so that shut down that construction, which was a good thing to see there was a response. But uh, And there is a whole suite of nesting cards for nest ob observations and then also for hatchlings. And with wood turtles, we uh, start nest monitoring after 60 days of incubation. They have temperature-driven incubation, so... Uh, two summers ago, I want to say, there was a really hot summer and it may have been coincidence or it may have been related, but it was the fastest development time I've ever seen for our nest, like a month faster than what we'd normally been seeing. Um, so it's ranged from like anywhere in late August into early October when we've seen nests emerging. Uh, and then in terms of where people do, this is kind of related to our program. So I've been using uh, Google Maps as a way to communicate with volunteers because most people can access it. And here you can see with, with this, there is kind of different levels of equipment you need. So the measuring stuff I put in green because it's kind of optional if you're doing that additional data collection. The file is in red because really, unless you've been assigned to do um, notching, our volunteers don't participate in that activity. So it's really data cards, things to keep you safe and happy and healthy when you're outside, and uh, something so you can record your lat long or UTM. And then these are up here. Um, a part of our training, things like just straight up don't hold turtles by their tails. I think everyone on this call knows not to do that. Uh, we have also tried to think about what photos we share. Um, I can't say as a perfect rule, I don't show well, share photos that have people and turtles, but I have stopped sharing ones where people are holding the turtles. So instead, it might be the turtle on the ground and the person sitting behind it. Uh, just to discourage unnecessary handling of turtles. Uh, and I almost never just share a turtle photo. Like This is collected so I can see the pattern of the those black blotches on the plastron. I wouldn't just share that on Facebook because it would make me look like I'm just out in the field turning turtles upside down. Uh, and we also don't want to accidentally encourage people to do that. So... If I haven't already taken too much of your time, like if you have questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer them now or by email or in future things, whatever works for you guys. So when you protect this, you take the little hatchlings and 
put them where you want or do you just let them roll? Yeah, so for hatchlings, we release them on site. Uh, in a couple of cases on site, we will move them slightly because they are in the middle of a um, like a farm road or something like that that does get used. Uh, and in rare cases where the turtles nested in a place that there's kind of imminent risk, like on a road shoulder for like a busier, a busier street, we will contact Lands and Forestry and ask them about alternative places to release them when they emerge. So kind of a case to case basis if there might be some risk to them. Because unfortunately, you do see like entire clutches that have been run over pretty much right after they emerged onto the side of a road. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions. Um, one is that, do you often find wood turtles that are missing one or both of their front feet? Yeah, <laughs> quite often. Raccoons, generally? Pardon? Raccoons, generally? I don't know. Um, I think it must be. I don't think in a lot of the cases it could be farming equipment or something bigger because there's no way it wouldn't have caused additional damage to that turtle. Um, so I imagine it's probably raccoons. Um, I know I had one farmer tell me he thought a turtle lost a leg in his like water intake, but I don't really also see how that would have been possible, but Uh, second question, the wood turtles that I've encountered have been in a couple of the streams in the outskirts of the Shubenacadie, um, in, like, say, outside of Lance or Elmsdale area. Is anyone doing any research or monitoring in that area? I think that a few years ago, uh, Iconoticate had done some surveys as part of a, um, it might have been an AFSAR-funded project, and also Mike Parker of East Coast Aquatics might have done a few surveys out there. He sometimes gets contracted by Environment Canada to do some wood turtle stuff. Because I think I remember, um, I think I remember seeing observations in the database. I don't know. I can check well, even. I'm in Wistlands and Forestry, so they might be mine. <laughs> oh yeah, they could be older ones too. I was thinking I saw some new ones pop up though. Okay. It was a nice river system. It had a couple of really nice sandy banks, which would have been perfect for nesting. Yeah, and that's one of the things we don't have in our watershed is very much remaining natural nesting habitat, like like kind of those like sandy uh, little nest beaches. We most of the turtles we see nesting are like road shoulders, farm roads, or areas that are have been flattened for development, kind of like in Princeton Greenwood, where we have quite a few new subdivisions being built. So in relatively high risk areas, unfortunately. Um, the last turtles I can see added in the Shubenacadie River were 2014. Will it tell me who did it? Can you see my screen? Is it still on the slides? Slides. Okay. Um, so Chris Pepper and Tom Neely, I have entries from, from 2014 and before that was 2011. I found them in uh, 2017, 2016, and 2018. Oh, sorry, you cut out for me there. Yeah, you're just cutting in and out too. I think it's the internet. Anyways, I think I ran bumped into them probably 2016 and 2018. Okay, I don't see that in here, so. All right, well, I can send locations to you if you like. Yeah, I can put those in. Um, any other questions out there? I just have a quick question um, relating to the permitting. Um, so are, is it expected that you would have a permit in order to do even 
just like visual um, monitoring practices or is it just for handling? Even for visual surveys. So the, that I don't know if it's changed or if it was always supposed to be that way, but just never was that way in the past. But at this point in time, DLF has been quite clear that even for visual surveys with no handling, they won't permit. Um, at first, when they updated the permitting form, I was kind of concerned because they ask for the names and CVs of every volunteer, which for the way our program works just isn't possible for me to know at the time mm -hmm. of issuing that permit. Uh, but they, like everything worked out um, the way that we've done things is that as I get new volunteers uh, or say I'm going out with a group and I'm kind of facilitating an activity and they're just coming out once, then I'll send that uh like the plan for that day to Pam at DLF and she has a record of it, but I'm not sending them like the CVs of 30 school children who I'll only ever see once. No one's got time for that. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay, so maybe it's a good time to wrap up. And if you have questions, um, you're welcome to email. And I'm not sure what we're gonna be able to do in terms of helping right now. Our organization is on a no fieldwork policy, but that should be kind of reviewed and reassessed on a weekly basis. So things could always change soon. Thanks so much, Katie. This has been really helpful. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this for us today. Yeah, thank you guys. Enjoy the rest yeah, of the you. afternoon. Thanks a lot. Thank you very yeah, much, okay. Katie. That's really interesting and educational. A uh, yeah. lot to think about here. So, And uh, Tim and Fiona, I'll email you this in case you want to send out the slides. That's Wonderful. perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay, bye. I'll see you. Bye. Okay, thanks. Bye.